this computer. All right, so let's go through our first lecture of 2023. It'll be pretty short. We're just gonna introduce how we approach experimentation and honestly, how the national, no, whoa, next generation science standards look at teaching for you guys. This is how your curriculum is set up, all right? So um, do you wanna sit over here? Do you wanna sit over here? Is it better? You got it? Okay, I can, oh, I forgot to tilt. Hold on. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. A wee bit more. And a wee bit. Oh, no. A wee bit. There you go. Okay. So, first things first, okay? We talk about scientific discovery in the concept of the cycle of inquiry. Now, inquiry is a really popular word in learning right now. What essentially inquiry is, is the idea that you discover as you learn. Your learning is through discovery, okay? That's the big idea. Yes, Mika? Uh, can somebody help Mika? It's on Canvas under unit one. You can download the link and then make a copy. Got it? We good? Okay, awesome. So uh, I introduced yesterday, but for us, we always start with the phenomena, okay? A phenomena is some real world event or problem. Something that you don't know how to explain or something that you don't know how to solve yet, all right? Real world problem or phenomena, or sorry, event. Uh, an event could be, why can't we walk through walls? Maybe that's a problem for you. You're like, why can't I walk through walls? Okay, and you often start by asking yourself, well, what do we wonder about that event? You're going to start by asking questions, which, by the way, is our skill today that we're going to be practicing. Is, And this is, by the way, supernatural for you. You're always inquiring about the world. Why? Because we're biologically evolved to ask questions about something that we don't know, something that's unknown to us. We say, what's that? Who's that? Ayo, ayo, chemistry and chemistry, you know what I'm saying? Okay, you ask questions and then you start constructing an explanation in your head to start answering the questions that you, you have. And you say to yourself, okay, what do I think? Based on my previous knowledge, all right? I start creating a preliminary or beginning explanation right? Uh, why can't I walk through walls where well, there must be something about my body that is colliding with something else? Okay, that's, that's me asking, starting to ask, answer my own questions. Okay, maybe if you have previous knowledge, you might know about the nucleus, that might be a previous knowledge thing that you might bring into that initial explanation. Okay, and so your initial explanation is always your best initial thoughts okay that's a terrible definition because it includes part of the word in it so that, i realize that and then what happens normally is as you ask questions and start to construct an explanation based on your previous knowledge you kind of get one that you're like okay i'm going to take this is the main question i want this is the main question i'm going to answer to answer my overall question so what we used to call this was a hypothesis, right? A testable question. This, by the way, is the update of the scientific method. The cycle of inquiry is the new version of the scientific method that California State Standards has developed, okay? And so this testable question eventually leads you to an experiment. You eventually go to how do I actually answer this question using now evidence that I've gathered. So far, so far, you guys need a shh. So far, everything is just based off of what you already know. Very anecdotal, very hearsay, very, I think this makes sense, okay? Now, this is what separates you from an average person. Now you test it. Now you actually get numbers and data and cite, cite things that you're like, look at my look at my research. Now, this is what I can say about this question. And so we say, okay, we gotta test it. We have to develop an experiment, okay, or procedure to gather evidence 
flash data, right? In order to answer that question, explain the idea, okay? And so we tend to gather two types of data, quantitative or qualitative, okay? Quantitative is all about the numbers, the measurements. Qualitative is all about the observations, the descriptive. So I qualitatively observe that I have youth in my room. I qualitatively observe that you brought backpacks, okay? Now, quantitatively, I observe that there are, what, 26 of you in the room? Quantitatively, I observe that you are the ages of 15 to 18. Quantitatively, I observed that 60% of you are wearing coats, right? So there are three types of investigations you can do. We tend in our class to focus on experimental because that is all about cause and effect. This tends to be our focus is experimental types of investigations and procedures. And the real goal is to develop identify relationships or develop relationships between how the patterns or variables connect. What if I notice that I notice a pattern in the room, an observation, okay? 50% uh, of you are, no, that's not true. 20% of you are curly haired. That's an observation, okay, that I make, a pattern. Can I create a relationship between your success in the class and your curly hair? <laughs> no, okay, but I don't know. I have to wait, collect the data. What if curly haired people just tend to get chemistry better? Is that a relationship using the patterns I have that I can connect and say, hey, there seems to be a correlation and dare I say, maybe even a cause effect. All of you rush to get perms, yes. As far as far as my analogy, yeah. I'm not willing to carry out my analogy further. Okay. Can I answer it like that? Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. So um, then we say after experimentation, now we collect our thoughts and we say, well, what do I know now? Okay, so what do I know is the analysis and evaluation of the data slash evidence. And what we do is what we is we develop develop I can spell maybe kind of we develop an answer slash explanation based on evidence and that is what makes scientists different when they answer questions. Anyone can, can in, in offer an explanation. Very few can back it up. Yes, Owen. Oh, yes. So why is this important? Well, how do you think scientists contribute to the scientific community? Through their paper publications. So why is it important? Your discoveries contribute to the scientific community. Like your input, your research matters. You literally are matter and you do matter, right? So we're gonna kind of start looking at experimentation in particular. And I want to, because we're taking a cause effect approach in most of our experiments, I wanna unpack cause effect. Because right now, how would you describe cause effect? Talk to a neighbor. How would you describe the cause effect? What, what is the cause effect? Why does it matter? What do you use that for? Where have you seen it in other classes? Talk to a neighbor, cause effect. Okay, you are not wrong. You are just not right. You know what I'm saying? Okay, what else have we heard?
Maria's not here, so not Maria. Hallie. Hallie, but not the berry part. Hallie. Okay. What are you what is your thoughts on Conspect? What have you heard it before? In physics. So for example. Excellent. So the fuel igniting caused the effect or the result of the kinetic energy being transferred to the rocket. Okay, it implode, okay, or explode. Excellent. By the way, I hate physics, so limit your physics mentioning. Okay, I actually do dock points. You think I'm lying? I am not. So anyway, um, excellent. So, but here's the thing with science is when we look at cause and effect, okay, uh, a lot of us just offhandedly kind of know what that means in a context. Like you, I saw this Instagram post yesterday where like someone put, you know how you, when you read a lot, there are just words that you know, but you can't explain them. You just know them when they're in a sentence. That's what a lot of terminology is in science for you guys. You've heard all these words. You can never offer a valuable definition of it. Like you have no valuable definition for it. You're just like, I kind of know what it means in the right context. Like, great. That's really imprecise. Scientists goal are to be very precise. Okay. So when we talk about cause and effect, the first thing that you really want to focus on is you got to first identify, okay, what is the initial cause? Now, sounds obvious, but it's going to be a little bit different depending on where you set your boundaries. So you got to first identify the cause within a set boundary. And what do I mean by that? Well, you'll see in a second. And then what you do is you kind of connect, right? So you, what you might do is you draw an arrow that represents a connection, right? Between the cause and your supposed effect. Now, all of this is sounding juvenile, but here's my question for you. Let's say dominoes falling. Let's say I push the dominoes with some force, okay? I do a push, I push. Okay, and this is domino one, and it collides with domino two, and it collides with domino three, and et cetera. What is my cause and effect? What are my boundaries? And what would you say is the cause? So one person, don't overthink it. Let's say Min. Like okay, so I push domino one. That's my cause. What's my effect? Um, it, it falls, and then like all the dominoes. Oh, that's many effects. What's my one effect? <laughs> the domino one falls. Okay, so cause, I push number one. Effect, I see number one fall. Okay, let me offer this one. What if I were to say, I push one, but number two falls? That's an effect. My boundary has now extended to two. So number one falling and pushing into number two is now the mechanism based off of gravity. It is now within the cause and effect. It is the arrow, it is above the arrow, but my arrow has now extended to number two. I could also say cause number one falls and number six falls. My cause in this boundary, in this definition of what we call a system, and what I'm analyzing is that number one falling is the cause, not the push, but it falling. And then number six falling is the effect. I could say one falling into two. I could say three falling into six. I could say four to six. I could say two to five. I could say two to four. I could say two to, uh, I could say six to five if I wanted to reverse it. I could say push to six, push to four, push to three. Cause and effect is inherently determined by the boundaries you set.
Boundary setting is very important when you create a lab. What are the boundaries? What are the conditions you're setting up in order to create an actual relationship that is clear? Simply saying one push all fall is not precise. And if you want to make a distinct relationship based on evidence, you got to be precise. Your question has to be specific. And that's old school method for understanding hypothesis. And it still is true. So when we look at experimentation, we always have a procedure. You guys are going to develop a procedure, okay, in your lab groups. And I heard no complaints so far about who you're with. Maybe they'll be later. But uh, you're right now, you're going to be in the same lab groups. And your procedure, by the way, is a very detailed step by step. And here's the important. You should be able to replicate it. If someone else cannot do your procedure, you created one, a bad recording of your procedure, but two, you created an unrealistic procedure. And also if someone's looking at your procedure and they're like, this is cray, like what, what in the world are you even talking about? That's also a problem, okay? <laughs> and then of course, when we look at cause versus effect, you have to identify your independent versus dependent. Your cause is your X on an axis, right? Is your, your cause tends to be your independent. I don't know of too many examples where the independent is your effect. Because the idea is that the independent is the thing that you manipulate, you change, you control from the beginning. Okay? And then the dependent, right, is your effect. Okay? It's the thing that you measure, the result. Then you establish the controls. What are the things that you stay constant? The variables slash conditions that stay constant, okay? And part of boundary setting is, part of the conditions and boundary setting of your, of your constants is, am I gonna be in an open or closed system? Am I looking at something that's exposed to the environment? Or am I looking at something that has a lid and is in a container? of some sort. And being exposed to the environment matters. A lot of things are spontaneously combustible with oxygen in the air. So you might not want a combustible thing in an open system, in an open experiment. An open experiment might be exactly what's going to kill you. You need a closed experiment. That's what often hoods for. We actually have special hoods where you can't even actually open the lid. You have to insert your arms through a shaft that's completely air sealed and has nitrogen flooding through and you store things that are super explosive and super reactive with the environment. It gets really sweaty. It's like bad material, it's gross. And you have to do your experiment through these like giant gloves that like no one's hands fit except for like giant men over six five. So it's not fun. I used to do that, not fun. Okay, and then of course you gather your data and evidence, obviously, and you got your quantitative, your numbered, and you got your observations, right? I'm just gonna leave it at that. We've kind of already covered it. And as you're doing that, you develop trials. You establish trials, or sorry, let me put it this way. You establish experimental groups and then you conduct many trials. So if I had a table, okay? An experimental group is the different versions of your X. So for example, you might have, you might decide, hey, I'm going to test how hair color affects, what am I thinking? Hair color affects making friends. More people are attracted to blonde, more people, whatever. I might say hair color A, hair color B, hair color C. That's an experimental group. That is a different variation of my X, my independent, okay? But then what I do is I look at several people. I don't look at just one blonde person. I look at 10 blonde people. That's a trial. A trial is just a repeat, okay? So then I might have trial one, trial two, Trial three for each variation. I look at three brown haired people. I look at four red haired people, right? OK. 
Okay. Your ultimate goal is to have nothing but accuracy and precision. Accuracy. Oh, and did that help a little bit? Okay. Accuracy is all about how correct are you? Like you do in the end want to be correct. But precision is also how specific are you? How consistent are you? If you have data that looks like a triangle, if you were to graph it, that's a problem. Because when you graph the trend line, that guesstimation of a trend is super extraneous. You're like, how am I supposed to trust anything that has a graph with a trend line there? Like, you'd be like, no. Like, if your life depended on this is the amount of drugs you can take, and you're like, this is the data I got. So, hey, by the way, if you're age like 18, you probably should take this amount of that drug, and you probably won't die. That's a problem. You'd be like, oh, yeah, no, no, I'm not taking that. No, I'm not taking that. Yeah. No, 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 we tested it. We tested it. And this is the results we got. And look at the trend line. We got a trend line. See, it's right there. N no, no, because this guy died like right down here. And uh, this guy died even a little lower. And yeah, I don't know what that guy's made of. That guy, that guy must be from like Mini Ninja Turtles, but I, I, I ain't calling that one. No, absolutely not. Right? You, you're not going to do that. You, you better not. Right? So. Okay. Um, when we talk about precision, we often notice in measured values, like let's say you're measuring out liquids, we say that the last digit is the uncertain digit. It's usually the digit you had a guess in. Like when you're looking at a graduated cylinder and you have all these lines, okay, your uncertain digit is, let's say this is three and this is four, and you have liquid up to here. Your uncertain digit is 3.21. It's the last one. Why? Because it's the one you had to guess passed in between the lines. You had to look and be like, I think it's 0.2. I think it's 0.1, right? 0.21. That last digit, when you measured it in lab, you're, you had to decipher what it was. You didn't try, you don't have a line telling you, oh, it's that. You had to be like, is it between that line 20% of the way or not? Okay. So um, when we do measure and you collect data, we use specific SI units, standard international units. For mass, we use grams. That should feel very obvious. A gram, by the way, a single gram is about a paper clip. So you are mini grams. That's why we measure people in kilos, okay? I am like 52 kilos, kilograms. I'm 52 kilograms, I think, for 60. I'm actually quite dense for my size. I work out a lot, but again, uh, I don't think, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I cannot arm wrestle no matter how much I bicep curl. It's just this, this movement is like, no one walks around like this, right? So you never build that muscle, all right? Um, volume, liters, symbol is L. L for standard international units. These are the units that everyone uses around the world except for Americans. We, we don't know why. We're, we're really just cocky people. Like really, we need to get over ourselves, but anyway. Um, you guys will often be working in milliliters, which is a scaled down version into the uh, 10 to the negative third power. Milliliters, good lordy, liters. Um, we'll address that in a little bit. And then you have length in meters with M. By the way, M can also mean mass in different equations when we start talking about relationships. So you're going to have to make a judgment call. Okay. And then temperature is in Kelvin. You've probably never heard of it. Or degrees Celsius. Forget Fahrenheit, folks. Forget Fahrenheit. Kelvin is a unique one. And I'm going to juice it later. But to get from Kelvin, to get from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, we say that degrees Celsius plus 273 0.15 equals a Kelvin. That's the unit conversion between Kelvin and degrees Celsius. This is the conversion equation. So um, when we have metric units, okay, when we do metric units, we love them because what we do is then we scale up and down by powers of 10. So we say that these are our base units. And then we put the base in the middle and we say, this is our base. 
And then what we say is, well, you know, a gram really sucks to measure in if you're talking about a, you know, a cow. So instead of measuring in paper clips, we might ramp up from by a power of 10, 10 to the power of one, 10 to the power of two. Um, we might go from deca to centa to kilo, 10 to the power of three. A thousand grams is a kilogram, okay? And then, you know what, I'm actually questioning. Did I do that right, guys? The SI prefix, deca, then centa? Hecto, it's hecto. Ha, 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 that's why it doesn't make sense. Hecto, we barely use this. Hecto, there it is. Hecto is a hundred of a base unit time, times 10 to the power of two. Okay, and then what if we're scaling down? What if we're trying to measure, I don't know, a bug, like a mosquito? Even a gram is too much. So we might scale down by a power of 10, 10 to the negative one, to deci, to centi, which you guys are very familiar with, centi, notice it's 10 to the negative two. It's moving that decimal over smaller, to milli. And there's far more, way smaller and way larger we can go. But we love these SI units because we can scale up and down from them without having to go from ounces to, to pounds to tons. Like we don't have new units. We keep it in the same unit and we just power of 10 up and down, okay? So um, when before we get into lab, a quick reminder is when you're measuring things, one, you'll often be working in the milli. You're often working in the milli and the grams, okay? When you measure anything with the graduated cylinder, or really anything, but by the way, this is a graduated center. We say that we measure from the meniscus. The meniscus is that dip in the water. And I'm gonna teach you why in about four units, why we actually see water seem to climb up the wall and create a dip. Why doesn't water actually just fall perfectly flat in containers? But for right now, what you're going to need to know is that when you measure from the meniscus, you have to measure from the bottom of the dip and that's your actual value of water. So folks, that means you're going to have to squat. Because if you measure from this angle, you have a bad angle. I assume none of you will lie down while you measure, so I'm gonna avoid that demo. But you have to get eye level and read from the bottom of the dip of the liquid, and that's your actual amount. Okay? Um, also, the equipment you choose is very important. You'll notice that some equipment has far less precision than others, just naturally in how it's built. Keep that in mind if you're particularly measuring an experiment that depends on your precision of liquid amount. I wouldn't choose a beaker. A beaker tends to be a general storage holder for most things. I have a sample of this and I just need to carry it. I need to have enough at my station. That tends to be what a beaker's for, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, we're going to hop over now to introducing phenomena. But before I start on that, are there any questions? No? OK, perfect. So let me show you the phenomena. This is just an example setup. And this is our question work or our kind of event that we're going to try to use to actually explore good experimentation. We don't actually have a new science concept quite yet. So what we have is, next slide. Okay, I want you to watch this little gif. Maybe. That, that's it. Okay. On your notes, just on the side underneath the next section, scientific experimentation, just somewhere in that area, somewhere on the side, write down, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Or an explanation, right? Asking questions, constructing an explanation, just write down a couple thoughts. Nothing super detailed, doesn't have to be complete sentences, just jot down some thoughts.
Okay. Just quick thoughts, nothing large, nothing big. Initial explanations. First letter, Juan. No, Juan, no, that's Juan. No, that's not Juan, that's where, where? Okay, now I feel bad. Do we even have a Juan in this class? Am I just going psycho? I was right. You just looked at me like I was wrong. Why would you do that to me? Now I feel bad. I literally just had anti-bias training yesterday. Now I feel like I failed. Okay, Juan, what is something that you observed or wonder or what? Oh, you just, you just assume it's baking soda. Yeah. So that's actually an explanation. You just explained it. Oh, uh, what am I trying to do? That's a great question. I'm also wondering. Okay, yes, Mika. I don't know if this also negates explanations that the gas would make all the reactions possible and this enough. That would definitely be an explanation. Okay. Cool, cool. So I think that suffices. So what we're going to do is, yeah, I'm just going to let that be. Okay, so what you're going to do is for the last eh, nine minutes, you are going to quickly get into your lab groups. And you are simply just going to try to recreate this once. You're just going to grab materials, recreate it once in your lab groups. If you remember your lab groups, that's very helpful. Okay, so you have materials over there. It is a one trial round. You're just gonna see if you can actually get this to happen. Tomorrow, you're gonna actually create an experiment plan, but you're just gonna see if you can get it to happen. So go, you got nine minutes, people.